my Hello. God. <laughs> hey there, John. How you doing, Good Jeff? to see you. Yep. <laughs> that music startled me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. So so we've got what like 90 minutes to to like learn how to build Blazor apps. That's that's a lot of time. We're gonna be able to build a ton with Blazor because it, it, you can be so productive with this. So and I mean it's a great time too to be getting into Blazor. There's a lot of new stuff with um .NET 6 just shipping, you know, yes. some a lot of great features there. Um so and then you've been busy improved. with this lately too, because you helped get this whole new learning path set up for uh, on Microsoft Learn, right? Absolutely. Go out to learn.microsoft.com, search for the Blazor Learning Path. And I think there's six modules there that'll get you started from not just learning what Blazor is, but like this module we're gonna do today, build your first app with Blazor, walk through and learn about components, learn about routing, layouts, all the things you need to build a pretty cool app with Blazor. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So I, I guess we should say hi. I'm I'm John Galloway. I'm a senior PM on the on the Microsoft uh, .NET community team and uh, work with a lot of web content and stuff. And my name is Jeff Fritz. I'm a principal program manager on the .NET and Visual Studio community teams, just like John. And and together, gosh, John. I feel like we do a lot of a lot of this video streaming, a lot of teaching folks over the web here like this. Yep, we sure so, do. <laughs> yeah, th this has become a lot of fun for us, and and we're thrilled to have you here to learn about building web apps with Blazor. So let's uh, let's take a peek, see if, if uh, who all's hanging out in chat over here. Um, I see a couple folks over over there on the the YouTube's and the Twitch. So good to see you. Some guy named Montemagno. Never heard I know. Of I think I've heard of that guy. I don't know. Not sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, hey, if you're out there watching, John and I want to make sure that you know we're listening. We're watching the commentary coming in. If you have questions about getting started, about building apps with Blazor, do us a favor. Drop a question on Twitch, on YouTube, on Learn TV. Let us know what you, what you need some help with. We have some moderators there that can help you out. And some of the uh, some of the best questions we'll answer right here live on the stream. That's right. All right. I think we can we can move on to some of our slides here and talk about what we're going to cover today. Yep. So we have some slides to kind of you know show what we're talking about, and then we're we're also going to be working through this learn module. So you can get to this. It's, AKMS Blazor ASP.NET Core, and that'll show that'll take you to this first one, which is kind of building your first web app with Blazor. Yeah, re really, we wanted to put together a first module that was as simple as possible, get you successful right away with all the tools that you need to build a Blazor application, and that's what you're going to see in this module. All right, so a couple of learning objectives. And I think, I think this is, once again, we, we want to get in easy. We want to make sure folks are successful. We want to configure your local environment for Blazor development with Visual Studio Code. It's, it, it's, it's not hard to do. There's just a couple places that you need to go online to, to get the pieces, whether it's Visual Studio Code, it's the .NET tools, um, and you'll be able to get started right away with our second bullet there, create a new Blazor project. Yep. And uh, the last piece that we're going to cover as part of the initial learn module is adding client-side logic to a Blazor web app. It, that sounds intimidating. What, what do you mean by client-side logic? What do you mean, John? Well, yeah, so that, that's a great thing to talk about. And part of why Blazor can be so useful, that when you're writing a web app, your code can execute on the server or on the client in your browser. And over, you know, way back in the day, all the code ran on the server and all you'd get on the client was just a little bit of HTML and you'd interact with it, send it back to the server to do all the thinking. And over time, browsers started getting smarter and more and more of that logic started moving down to the client. So, you know, a lot of applications, you'll have tons of JavaScript running and that's gone through the years from, you know, a bunch of jQuery to React and Angular and things. But a lot of .NET developers, myself definitely one of them, I'm better with C Sharp, and Same I can thing. write my 
client side logic better with C sharp. And so that's one of the neat things with laser is that I can use WebAssembly and C sharp code to do that. And, and some of the techniques that we're going to show you, if you've worked with WPF, if you've worked with WinForms, you've worked with some of the XAML frameworks, they're, they're going to seem kind of familiar to you. You've done some of this before as a .NET developer. So we think you're going to be very comfortable getting started with Blazor. Yep. Um, I see a, a question here from uh, Eric, Eric Diane Strickland asking, can we show that link for the learn module? I will go back and show that one more time. There you go. AKA MS blazer dash ASP net core. All right. There you go, Eric. Um, I, there's a couple more questions here before we get started. Do, do you think we should take a few here, John? Yeah, why not? There, there's one um, from Handy Handy asking if it's better to build with VS Code or in Visual Studio. And we're going to be showing our code demos in VS Code, partly because tiny download and runs on any platform. Yeah. Um, but you know, if, you, if you're on Windows, Visual Studio, uh, or on Mac, Visual Studio for Mac, or kind of a more full IDE, they're going to give you a little more help and templates and debugging experience. Um, but for getting started, VS Code is a pretty quick, just lightweight, simple get started path. Yeah, it's it's the minimum you need that's just available everywhere. And it, absolutely, if you want that Cadillac experience, you want that that best of breed, all all the bells and whistles, check out Full Visual Studio. So yeah. thanks for the question there. Handy handy over on YouTube. Um uh, uh, one other one, and I guess we'll kind of get into more of this as we go along, but um, Banditool asking, uh, my end goal is to build a simple multiplayer game in the browser as I learn. Would Blazor Server be a good approach or Wasm plus a server API? I, I, I like these types of questions because it's, it's the, uh, here's my scenario, here's where I want to go with things. And the answer, of course, is always depends. Yeah. Like not quite sure what you're trying to accomplish with that multiplayer game um, because some interesting things start happening as you're pushing messages back and forth. I, uh -huh. John, I, I think when you're pushing messages from, from the server to the client, that gets me thinking not just an API, but signal R. Yeah. And, and that's, and we've got some slides on this coming up too, as we dig more into the different types, but that's one place where Blazor Server can be nice because it's already got SignalR hooked up for you. Yeah. And you've already, so if you've got multiple, if you've got code that's running on one person's machine, that's a slam dunk for Blazor Wasm for me. If you've got like a lot of server side interaction, that's where I start thinking about Blazor Server. And as James uh, mentions in the comments, definitely check out Awesome Blazor because oh gosh, yes. Awesome Blazor is this incredible resource it's a list of all the all the cool things, including like components from component vendors, tons of open source projects, and in this example, there's uh, there's some game examples, and you can look at the code and see how they're building apps. I'm so. I'm not going to say anything specific, but there's a demo in there that shows how to use Diablo, how to play Diablo in the browser, the old game from the '90s. Wow. That. It's not running specifically on Blazor, but it's running on some of our .NET technology in the browser. Very, Very cool to check out. You can just click through and, and play a little bit of that right from um, that awesome Blazor list. Very cool stuff. All right. Cool. All right. Let's, let's charge on. We've got a lot Let, to cover. Absolutely. All right. So we covered our learning objectives. So yes, we are live and interactive. Say hi, ask questions in the chat. Let us know where you're, where you're dialing in from, where your broadcast dial is set at, where you're watching us. And uh, we're happy to call out and say hello to you, wherever you might be. We already introduced ourselves. Moving on. So Blazor does all kinds of really cool things for us because we're C-sharp developers and, and we've been wrapped up for the last few years. And how can we use how can we use our favorite .NET, frame, .NET framework, ASP.NET Core, with some of the really cool JavaScript frameworks to build web apps? Blazor lets us use those C Sharp skills to build a web app with C Sharp and .NET. Mm -hmm. So we can accelerate our app development because we've got the same language and framework on the front side and the back side, both in the browser and on the server. 
We can reduce the complexity of the build pipeline because we don't necessarily need to call out and run NPM install and, and run linting processes to go and, and make sure that all of our um, all of our JavaScript code is, is structured properly. We don't need to go through any Webpack. John, Webpack. Mm -hmm. Learning Webpack was like There's my nightmare. There. Yeah. Oh. But I know how to MS build with the best of them. So that makes things much easier for us. Simplify maintenance. I mean, everything's in one place. You can update all your NuGet packages together, update your .NET runtime, your, the, the version of .NET that you're using all at the same time and deploy that independently of the .NET framework on the machine because Blazor runs on .NET Core and now .NET 6. Mm -hmm. Also, because it's .NET and C Sharp on the front side and the back side, that means we can let developers understand and work on both the client side and server-side code. We don't have to do this isolation of skills. We can have these full-stack web developers helping on the entire application, not just one part of it. Yeah. You know, a great question related to that. Jamal asks, uh, could WebAssembly replace JavaScript? And the way I think of this is it's, you're at, it's another option to add on, right? So uh, I don't think we're ever going to replace JavaScript. That's a, it's a, you know, honestly, it's it's really great at solving a lot of problems. Um, but there are cases where as a, you know, if I'm mostly a .NET developer and I'm building applications mostly with .NET, being able to continue to use my logic and libraries and and all uh, and my skills in .NET is it's a nice thing to add to my toolkit. Absolutely. I, John, I also think about how the the web browser technology deprecates things, but never really removes them, mm -hmm. right? We can still yeah. use the marquee tag. Yeah. Like, right, or the blink tag. They're yeah. still out there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I agree with you. I don't think it's ever going to replace JavaScript. I, I think as as the runtime, the, the WebAssembly runtimes improve, you're right. It's going to become a, a very attractive place for, for us as .NET developers to build First, it might mm -hmm. become a, a higher priority, but for simplicity, I think JavaScript is out there and it's going to still be very useful for us. I agree completely. And even within a Blazor application, it's not either or. So you can definitely sure. use JavaScript with JS Interop. You can use JavaScript in addition to, you know, JavaScript libraries in addition to your, uh, your WebAssembly code. And what some of the neat features that they just showed at .NET Conf with .NET 6 is you can actually expose Blazor WebAssembly components as web um, web components that can be used in, in Angular, React, or other frameworks. So there's really, it's it's not an either or, it's a best of everything. Oh yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on to our next slide. Da, da, da. There we go. So what is Blazor? And we're, we've been answering que questions about how we can use it, what we can do with it. Well, mm -hmm. what is it? Well, Blazor WebAssembly means that brow uh, developers can run your .NET code in the browser. Now, that's not just you navigated somewhere and, and it executed and we've, we've got some uh, funny text fields or reform fields sitting in the browser. No, no. Your .NET code executes in the browser it's it's delivered it's shipped down and and it executes on top of the web assembly runtime so you're going to build razor components that run on top of a .NET runtime that all sit on top of web assembly and run in the browser which is is really cool and this is a feature if you go to the next slide this is a feature that's available in every modern browser now so you've got support built in this is something that you know people you may not know about. It's easy to kind of you know not know that, but this has actually been there for years, and this is support for running binary code in your browsers. And it's not just .NET, and this isn't not just a Microsoft or .NET thing. It's um something that's it's a browser standard, and so yeah. people are running WebAssembly with Rust and C and all kinds of other languages, but. I kind of like C sharp. So yeah, they, there's no plugin needed, like you were saying. And and John, when I think about these four major browsers that, that are available to run in, right? They they've all got that evergreen deployment capability. 
they, they're going to update themselves to the latest version when it's available. Um, and, and we've all been kind of forced into that version of these browsers. It, I, I, I keep, I always bring up and point back to it. Do you remember Spectre and Meltdown? Do, do you remember those? Oh, yeah. You remember those issues we had a couple summers ago and everybody quick ran and updated their operating system? Guess what you got when you updated that? WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, the, um, um, Alvaro is asking a great question, and James is on the ball with all the answers, so he's already answered this. But uh, can I use Blazor with, in a hybrid approach? Can I use Blazor with Razor Pages or something else? And that's one of the great things because it's it's web standard. You can use it completely in conjunction. And so, like we have in the .NET website, most of the .NET website is server rendered. Uh, it's ASP.NET Core Razor Pages. But then we built portions of it, including the live TV, the .NET live TV, that's in uh, in Blazor. It's Blazor WebAssembly, but it completely mm -hmm. integrates, and uh, it's and we're able to share code and and libraries and services. So yeah, it's not Absolutely. just you could do it. We're doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's a great example of a, a site that does mixing and matching of, of various ASP.NET and .NET web technologies. Um, that we used to talk about one ASP.NET five, 10 years ago. We, it's still here. You can still use all the things together from all the ASP.NETs. So, yeah. all right. So we talked about WebAssembly. Well, what's Blazor server then, John? Yeah, it's interesting. So, so Blazor first started with a, hey, could we do WebAssembly with .NET? And then there's also web components or a thing and all that. So could, could we build that out? So, so as we built that, that was taking a little time to get solid and ready to ship. And what the, the team was, was um, as they were looking at it, they said, you know what? We can more quickly serve a Blazor server. We can get you Blazor server. So Blazor server actually shipped as the first supported option. What's, what's neat there is all your .NET code executes on the server and it uses SignalR, which is uh, like uh, web sockets to communicate directly and update the DOM. So with this, the way I think about this is a lot of what Blazor brings you is a really nice component-based web development model where I can write .NET code against components. And you know, it's, it's really kind of a, a much simpler, smoother, uh, uh, I don't know, way of building if you're if you're focusing on components. And what's nice with this is I can write the same code and I can run it either on the server or on the client. I'm almost no changes to them, right? So if I if I create Blazor components, I can run that on the server if that's if that's more convenient, or I can run it in the client. So. Yeah, right. It it and I, I also look at this as it exactly how you're describing i can i can build that same user interface and run it either client or server i i look at that also as a little bit of a fallback if something happens and and for some reason the browser vendors or a device vendor says you know what we're not going to turn on web assembly in in our in, in our browser on on the foo phone we're going to invent the foo phone and you know what it doesn't have web assembly in the browser mm -hmm. that's okay we can still run all of our code, just pick it up and move it on the server and it still runs. Another um, another nice use case is, and this came up earlier when we were talking about the game scenario, is yeah. if my Blazor application, if my Blazor code needs to access a bunch of server-side resources, I need to hit a database or I need to be you know, interacting with a bunch of other backend services, there's two ways I can build that. One is, in WebAssembly, I can make a bunch of HTTP calls to a REST client and and handle that. But if I if I'm really you know doing a lot of backend server side work and I just want those quick updates, Blazor Server is great because my Blazor Server because my ASP.NET Core application is running on the server, it's right there, right next to the database and everything else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the the important thing to know about this to, to think this through is. It, that that blazer uh you see it there the razor components.net in the little cloud there running in a nice fluffy blue cloud uh, you might it's a wonderful shade of blue um yep. 
it's running on whatever .NET runtime is there in the cloud. Same thing when we ship it down in WebAssembly. Those Razor components, that Blazor uh, application is running on whatever .NET version we ship, either in WebAssembly or onto that server. You don't have to run it on something, some special gimmicky thing that's hanging out there. It runs with standard .NET. Yeah. Oh, one other really cool question. Jose asks, what mm -hmm. kind of connection does um, does SignalR and Blazor Server use? So in general, it's going to use WebSocket, but then SignalR has support for fallback. So yeah. pretty much everything has WebSocket support now, but if it doesn't, SignalR can fall back to other protocols. There's always that one network that you don't know when you hop onto it that might be blocking WebSockets. Yeah. One other neat thing, too, is you can hook this up. You can use SignalR with um, like Azure SignalR service mm -hmm. and, and scale up with that, right? So there's a lot yeah. of options because it's running using SignalR. When, when I think about needing to get tens of thousands of folks connecting to the same service and receiving updates, that's when I want to use uh, Azure SignalR service. Yep. Cool. All right. Um, who's oh, that I think there? we have a really pretty slide next. Is there? Is there? The, the next slide, I think we stole from James. Is that right? Ooh, look at that. Look at that. And he may have stolen it from somewhere else. But this is a nice kind of side-by-side -side comparison, right? Yeah, yeah. So you've got you've got Blazor server on the left side, and that SignalR, that's the, the kind of breakdown between the, you know, the browser is on the left side and everything else is over on the right side. And then Blazor WebAssembly, you've got, you know, most of the code running on, and and this shows also the um the kind of the trade-offs, you know, with Blazor WebAssembly, you've got a larger download size because you're shipping that whole runtime down to the client. Yep. Um, yep. Now, when we say larger, we're we're talking about a meg. Yeah. Two megs. We yep. we have all kinds of gimmicks that we've put into gimmicks and tricks. We we've got a the ASP.NET team has quite a bag of tricks when it comes to compressing and, and shipping technology for the web. Um, things like Brotly compression they're using when you publish your application mm -hmm. to to get all that content that it does need need to ship down in no full. It is a little bit larger, a meg or two is that's pretty good size application. But Blazor Server, John, that's. That's really thin when you're shipping that down, isn't it? Yeah, it, it really is. Um, Blazor server is, so if you, if you, the way I like to think about it is how long do you expect someone to interact with your page? Yeah. If it's, if it's something where they're going to be on the page and interacting for a while, several minutes or something, then it's definitely worth giving them, they, they can wait for a meg or so, or two download because they're going to have much better experience running locally. But if it is something where you're like, no, I need the absolute fastest load, then Blazor server is just going to ship down HTML and then connect back to the server to get all uh, via WebSocket to get all the updates. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that's very, very fast to get those updates because it's only shipping, like you said, just those little pieces of HTML. Yep. Um, you know what? I see a couple questions here. I'm I, I'm going to go off script slightly here, and I'm going to do a little cross promotion here. I see some questions from is it uh, Shanawaz Shanawaz Khan on YouTube mm -hmm. um, asking about real world examples of Blazor WebAssembly using Google or Facebook authentication in a Blazor WebAssembly app, and also wants to see a little bit about state management. John, we were talking about doing something tomorrow, maybe, for the mm -hmm. ASP.NET community stand-up. We could touch on those tomorrow. What do you think? Sure, why not? Yeah. Okay. Today, we're focused pretty much on, on the Learn module. So we're not going to go too far off script and, and talk about those little bit more advanced topics. But I think we can cover that tomorrow on, on that stream. And there, of course, will be a recording you can catch up with on that. Yeah. And Rob is sharing too, a link, or um, mentioning in the chat on, on YouTube about the Blazor package. And one of the really cool things about uh, Blazor in general is there's this huge ecosystem that's built up for all sorts of things, Blazor, Blazor Eyes, and, and Mud Blazor, and all these kind of packages and frameworks people have built that handle things like uh, local storage or, mm -hmm. you know, kind of more advanced authentication or, or 
theming or all sorts of things, right? Um, absolutely. And, and that goes back to that awesome Blazor link that we had. You can find all kinds of open source community, uh, community sources, community resources out there. That's what I was thinking of. Community resources out there and also commercial packages as well. There's a mm -hmm. great commercial ecosystem that's sprung up around Blazor that you can use if, if you want that that paid support that you know you can call somebody to to address and hopefully fix issues you might be having. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, it's great to have that option. Um, yeah. Sometimes people think, oh, I shouldn't have to pay for things and all the software, you know, but actually for a lot of businesses, you want to pay so that you can get that support and you know that the company is going to be around for a while and um, that they're doing all the, you know, testing and support stuff. Yeah. Hey, it's been 25 minutes yeah. and it's been all slides. Okay. So I'm pretty happy that the next coming slide. up yeah there we go it's time to write some code we're gonna write some code let's do it in fact i we want to show how to get how to get up and running i want to make sure i talk through how to get the dotnet sdk and what you need to install with vs code first and then we can build our first blazer app right away here what do you think let's do it all right i am going to escape out of the slides here and jump over first thing that you need to do of course is install visual studio code but after you install Visual Studio Code, I want you to go to dot, dot .net. That's D-O-T period N-E-T. And it's going to take you to dot .net dot Microsoft dot com. And you're going to get this wonderful purple screen. I de I've developed quite a taste for purple over the past few years. <laughs> Not it's a nice lie. gradient here, too. Yeah. You know. A little, little purple for everyone. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to click through to download because Blazor runs on dot .net. You can download .NET and right now for for the foreseeable future here for the next year or so, if you're watching this video sometime after November 2022, you're not going to see the same thing here, but we're going to recommend you go get the .NET 6 SDK. So click through and download. In my case, it's recommending the Windows .NET SDK 64-bit here for me to download and install so I can, I can build applications. Yep. And the important thing is you want the SDK, the software developer kit. You don't want the runtime. Runtime is only for executing code, but you need the SDK to actually build applications. Yep. So um, so I've already downloaded and installed the SDK. Of course, if you need for a different operating system, or even if you want to run it in a container, we have Docker containers available as well. But I've already clicked through and installed it because let's face it, watching something installs like watching paint dry. Yep. Yeah. Uh, one good question that just came in, uh, Ningrand's asking sure. about um, deploying and deploying with static web apps and all that. And we're actually not going to cover that today. We we had kind of wanted to, but we actually have an entire show dedicated to that um, in this series, in the Learn Live series coming up. There you so, go. There Check you it go. out. So that's not, it's not the next one, but it's coming up in December. I think it's about a week or two further out, but you're going to want to tune in and see more about that. Um, and of course there's, there's a learn module, there's tutorials out there that'll teach you. But if you want to see, you want to see two of these friends talking through and, and helping you out with it, we'll, uh, we'll have another episode coming up on that. All right. Yeah. And that, that is one really neat thing too, um, is that your deployment options with Blazor WebAssembly, you can host it. It's just static files so you can yeah. you can host it on anything uh, which Absolutely. is pretty neat people host it on like github pages or whatever but definitely azure static web apps is an option mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, all right so you got your sdk i've got the sdk installed let me go over to my windows terminal i've tricked out my windows terminal oh, nice. i've look at that yeah that's that is pretty I, I like the lime green. I'm i'm a <laughs> what can i say i'm a developer from from the 70s and 80s i like the lime there green you go terminal. Yeah. Um, so let's build our first application. I'm going to build a Blazor server application here. So I'm going to say .NET new, and I'm going to create a console app. Uh, I'm sorry, a Blazor server application. So Blazor server is the name of the template we're going to create. And I'm going to call this first app. All right. Wow. Okay. So we're creating a Blazor server for this or Blazor web assembly? We're creating a Blazor server. Okay. If I'm, if I'm remembering... The module properly. All right, I'll double check while we do it. Yep, laser server. You're right. I I'm sorry I ever doubted you. 
That's right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Sean, nice to see you on the Twitch chat. All right. So there it is. I have a folder called First App. Yeah. Because I specified the output folder called First App. You see it up there. So let's go into that folder. And let's take a look. And okay. Um, I can't really tell what's going on here. Let's open that in Visual Studio Code and get a little bit closer to the code here. Yeah. So here's Visual Studio Code. And when we take a look at the list of files over here, let me zoom in a smidge. Um, it kind of looks like an ASP.NET app, an ASP.NET Core app. It does. Yeah. You know, one interesting thing, and this is .NET 6, right? It so is. So we don't have a startup CS. We just have a program CS now. That's right. Interesting. All right. So, um, right, just to show that this is .NET 6, I'll look in the project file and you can see this is a .NET 6 project. Now, okay, it runs and it feels like, it even looks like an ASP.NET Core app. If we take a look at the code here, it it has those ASP.NET things because it is, it's Blazor server. It's running on the server side and a web app that runs on the server with .NET is mm -hmm. ASP.NET Core. So for instance, like on line eight, you've got add razor pages. So you've got yeah. support for razor pages here. It's a server side ASP.NET Core app. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And line nine, we're going to add server side bla Blazor. We're going to turn on the server side Blazor uh, user interface capabilities with this application. Nice. Okay. Just like the other ASP.NET templates, we have a weather forecast service that we configure to start with here. And we're going to be able to use that to generate some fake data over here. I'll just navigate to that real quick. Oh. Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. So that is, by the way, I'm used to whenever something pops up on the screen, I assume it's an ad or, or something and I get rid of it. But that one, you actually did the right thing. You said yes, because what you're doing is telling Visual Studio Code, go ahead, set this up to run as a .NET app. So yep. it, it sets up yep. the tasks and, and stuff and, um, for debugging and everything. So th this is an, an old style uh, if, a, um, ASP.NET Core API, and it's just returning some, some fake weather data. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and here's what we used to have in that startup configure segment here. We're building an app and we're configuring the HTTP pipeline. So we want SSL support. We want to support static files like images and CSS style sheets. Routing, of course, we like routing. But yeah. this one here, Map Blazor Hub. You were saying about SignalR, right? Yeah. So that's where it's going to configure the SignalR Hub so that all the stuff we render on the server with Blazor it just ships those updates and all of our um, navigation happens with signal R. You don't have to do anything to, to enable this or to decide what content to send back and forth. It's all handled for you in ASP.NET Core. Okay. Um, all right. So th that's program. It, I think of program like... Let's see an actual Blazor page. Do we, where's our page? Absolutely. I, I was going to say, I think of program like a rotisserie grill. I set it and I forget it. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? So here we go. That's a Blazor page. Hmm. Okay. So If I was new to this, I would yeah. first look at it and say, whoa, there's some HTML. This is just HTML. I see my H1. But yeah, then I get absolutely. I confused because survey prompt and page title, those are not HTML. Yeah, those, gosh, those are HTML5. No, those are not HTML5. <laughs> Who knows now, right? Yeah, yeah right. Um, so, and, and if you're familiar with Vue or React or Angular, you're used to seeing things like directives, right? You see tags mm -hmm. that get turned into some other, some other code behind the scenes that actually execute and format based on the contents of those tags. Same concept here. This is a Blazor component called page title or another component called survey prompt. And nice. we'll see where survey prompt is defined in just a little bit. One nice thing too is that in every ID, like Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code both do this, They're, the syntax highlighting is a little different, right? So the H1 tag is an HTML tag and that's blue. Yep. And whereas the Blazor component tags are that teal, green? Teal, turquoise. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. 
so that you can tell that, hey, that's that's something that some code's going to execute before it renders and delivers something based on this content. Nice. So, okay. Now, John, I don't know if you noticed, but this also has a dot razor extension Ooh. instead of CSHTML. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how different are those? Good question. So dot CSHTML files are files that, that aren't processed by the Blazor runtime. CSHTML files are are rendered by ASP.NET. They they turn into HTML or or some other format that's been declared and just get shipped directly to the browser. Where .razor files, there's some code execution and logic going on there. They're picked up and they're recognized as a component, and we'll see in a little bit, they can also have some event handlers in there that will allow them to trigger and do other things as, as our viewers interact with the, uh, with the pages there. Okay. Huh. So, I, I'm not sure I follow there. There's a question. Why can't we see the page title component? Uh, we do see. The... So why can't we see the source oh, code oh, to the page title? Here, yeah. So, um, that good question. The, the page title component is actually a component that ships with Blazor. So we could see it. The source code is available. It's over on GitHub. It's not shipped as part of this project. It's not something that we compile and, and we have as that user created and maintained component with our applications. And that's a good point. There's a lot of components that are shipped with Blazor, including a lot of like input, uh, form input tags. Um, when Absolutely. I, when I was first, you know, trying to actually write some some code on my own and build some things, I was started hand rolling all my form editing code because I was just used to doing that. And then pretty sure. soon I was like, oh, well, all of the there's input tags for just about anything with Blazor. Right? Yeah, and and when we think about why do we need input tags, um, and I don't want to dive too far into this because. Yeah form input tags and making your Blazor applications in, in your forms better is another module in the Blazor learning path. But you'd want to consider that when, when you've got all kinds of things you want to you wanna work with in your form, like model binding, validation, and you want these, these input elements to work together to deliver a, a cohesive and complete experience mm -hmm. for, for your customers, for your viewers that are interacting with your application. So it takes just that simple HTML text element and levels it up and gives it a couple more superpowers to go along with it. Mm -hmm. All nice. right. So this is the index page. Uh, that, that's that's kind of lame. Can we look at something a little bit more complex? Sure. All right. Let's look at something that actually has some code that executes on it. This is the counter. Now, this is probably one of the simplest examples that we can unearth here before we start running the application. Once again, we've got a page title, counter. Mm -hmm. um, we know what an H1 is. We've got a paragraph with a role of status and a current count. And see, that looks like Razor to me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, at current count. That's picking up this current count field down here, and it's going to output the value right there. Now, next up on line nine, we've got a button, and it's got some it's got some bootstrap classes here, button and button primary, um, and it's got an on click method here called increment count, and it says in the label click me. Now, increment count is just this method right here. One thing that I had to wrap my head around a little bit moving from ASP.NET Core and JavaScript development to this is that binding is just implicit, meaning when I change that, when current count plus plus happens, that role, that paragraph tag updates immediately. I don't need to say update or, you know, I don't need to say go find this element and set the thing. It's a, it's a, it's a binding system. There is no on property changed going on here. Yeah. yeah. It, the, the, um, the Blazor runtime is watching because of this binding here to this field, it's watching when that field changes and updating where it's being referenced in the user interface immediately. So if you're a desktop or, or mobile developer, your 
expecting this and used to that, right? You're used to bindings. And also for React or Angular, but for if you're mostly uh, working on server-side apps or ASP.NET Core, you know, like Razor Pages MVC, this is something where I would say, hold on, wait a minute, you know, but that this you're expecting this page is gonna be displayed for a long period of time, and it's going to be, the binding is gonna keep things up to date. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. What do you say we go through it and, and we take a look at this and then we'll talk about the fetch data sample that's in it as Let's well. do it. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, just like it says in this in um, in the module, I'm going to .NET watch to get this started. And then we're going to tinker with this a little bit. So here at the command line, I could say .NET run, but we're going to .NET watch and take a look at this application. So that's going to be cool, neat things going on here too. You used to have to type .NET watch run. Now mm -hmm. you can just say .NET watch and that's that's automatic. And the other cool thing is that with .NET 6, it, it has a really cool, the, the hot reload is really smart now, right? So like yeah. it, it doesn't refresh the entire page, it just pushes those changes down. Exactly. Now we'll, we'll get to hot reload in just a second, but there's our initial page. Hello world, we saw on the H1. And there's our Blazor survey. Mm -hmm. right, let me go back over to VS Code, right? So if I go back to the index page, right? There's that survey prompt. So Great I mentioned- question. Can you update that title? Would it reload? This title right here or, yeah. or up here? Uh, there. This one. How is Blazor working for you? Um, John, would you like a glass? Uh, spell it right, of uh, water. And I'll save that and go back over to here. And Whoa, I'll... okay, there you go. Yeah. Right? So, um, and we can even put these side by side, right? We can we can do that thing here, right? Because Windows is cool like that. Yeah. And... So question, uh, you could, because that's a component, you could put two of those in the page, right? You could put two surveys? Oh, absolutely. Right, and just put another one here, and boom. Okay. Right. Um, so the, this concept that we think folks are going to enjoy, are going to, are going to really like to use of hot reload that, that John's calling out here, being able to update your user interface and see those changes reflect immediately is going gonna, is gonna to help make you more productive. And it works whether you're using Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio, uh, Visual Studio for Mac. Heck, John, I don't care if you're using Vim. .NET Watch is going to work with you and make this happen. All right. I'm uh, Takvim says spaghetti. So maybe a viewer of way long ago when I did some early MVC tutorials, we used spaghetti a lot. Uh, <laughs> there, there's a question here. Several people are asking what is actually in the browser, meaning like, um, if you view source or if you, if you look at, you know, our, look at the developer tools, let's bring them yeah. up. Right. Um, so oh, come on now, there we go. Let's get Elements. rid of this page. Oh shoot. My bad. Yeah. It's a new, it me. defaults to welcome and you need to go to elements. There you go. Yeah. So let's go to, uh, I see my console is full. There we go. Yeah. So if we look at this, we've got this body. We've got an initial div tag here. There's the header. And here's the main. And we just saw, right, the article in the middle. And there's our divs for that those uh, elements right there. Mm -hmm. So you get exactly what's being painted in, in the screen there. Now, that's the current, right? the current page, if we take a look at the source itself, right, you get a couple elements here that are pointers so that Blazor knows how to pick things apart and exactly what's going on on the page. And that's okay. It's mm -hmm. comments, it's hidden there so that it knows a little bit about the state of the page that it's presenting. And this is one slight difference, or I guess kind of major difference that you'll see between WebAssembly and Blazor Server, right? Because Blazor mm -hmm. Server is shipping this tiny little shell and then connecting back to the server and getting the information, executing the code, whereas Blazor WebAssembly is actually going to ship everything down to you, right? So you're going to see more of it. Well, so let's go over to, to that counter page where we've got a little bit of interactivity. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and in fact, I'm going to go over to the network tab here so we can see the network activity. I'm going to click on counter. So we go to the counter page. Watch the network activity over here. All right. Nothing happened. Mm, something actually did happen. I'm, I'm on the JS tab. One second. Let's go back over here. Go to home. Back over. It's not showing me exactly what I want to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to be on the web sockets over yeah, here. Yeah, I mean, okay. Right? So when I click around, you can see my web socket connection here is actually doing some things. Let's yeah. click in and check this out. And we that's can pretty see... neat. Those are binary messages, right? Three bytes for one of them. <laughs> so those, right? that is very, very compact. Yeah. Very, very small. So as I start to interact with this, we saw there was an on-click event handler that just incremented that number. So when I click and increment, right, look at what all happened. We, we sent a message, and there, there's the binary, what's going over there. Begin invoke.net from JS, right? And can I open this up just a little bit more? Let's see, can I get that over here? There we go. So look at this. It's sending, uh, this looks like a, a method call. Begin invoke.net from JS. Yeah. Ditch, dispatch event, event handler ID for event name, click. It, it's yep. sending the, the click event handler and it's telling it exactly where on the screen it was clicked. X and Y coordinates and which mouse button it was. If the control key, shift key, alt key, the meta key were pressed and we can follow what happened after that the server send, sends back, we'll go render, and it's got oh. some compressed information here that ends up being yeah. that one. Nice. Okay. So That was a great question. I'm glad, glad that was asked. Yeah, right. There's a lot of back and forth that happens here that's really just a couple bytes being sent back and forth. Mm -hmm. okay. So... You know, in, in some way, and, and there's all these different trade offs you make as a, as a web developer, and the answer is always it depends. But yeah, this is a, a great example of you can build an incredibly responsive application that scales really well. You're still executing your .NET code on the server, um, but you're, you know, making these tiny little page updates and you're sending just binary over the wire there with WebSockets. So, absolutely. And um, so uh, Rizwan was asking about the the comment tags that used to be in the in the Blazor markup. And as you as you look at the content that's being delivered here now, it, it's no longer part of what's painted inside of our tags inside of our content. Those those comment tags that used to be delivered as almost markers as part of .NET six, they're not there anymore. One other interesting thing there is you'll see, like, say, for instance, that div class page, and then you've got B dash four, blah, 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 blah. And so those are those are those are kind of those markers now, like it can use those as identifiers. And you can yeah. you, you can also use that for like um, the CSS, uh, like it can use that for the localized CSS as well. Right. There's a there's a feature that's available to you um, called CSS isolation that will use some of this in its rendered content to, to help ensure that the, the styles that you want to apply just to a component are, are isolated and only apply to that component. And Blazor uses this, this little tag that it renders here so it knows more about exactly where that needs to land. Mm -hmm. We had them on uh, ASP.NET Community Standup, and they, you know, when they were talking about that, they said, "Hey, we looked at what's what patterns are working really well for other front end communities, and for yeah. like if if you look at Angular and React, that's kind of the the standard sort of approach that they're using." And yeah. so they said, "That's you know, we're happy to learn from what's working well across the web uh, yeah, ecosystem." Yeah, they, right. We're part of a larger technical community when we build and deliver web applications and frameworks and tools, we want to make sure that what we're building isn't completely foreign to what you may already be using. So I've got a question. If we go into yeah. our backend code, into our, like, can we look at our counter again? Sure. Let me head I'm over there. curious if, the, if that code block in the counter, could we change that so that instead of incrementing like plus plus, could you change that to like minus minus? Sure, we can absolutely do that. Right. In fact, let's do it while it's up here. Let's put these two side by side. I'm going to close the 
developer tools there. I'm going to change that. Um, here, you come here. I'm trying to put these side by side and it decided to navigate to the to the next screen over. Yeah, give me one of those. And I'm just going to change that to minus minus. I'm not even going to touch a thing. See the check in the corner there, John? Yes. That was hot reload running. It didn't change that three. So that is really cool. So where it says current count, current count is still three. Yeah. I didn't lose that. So I no. like imagine as a web developer, you're building something and you've got tons of form fields and you've clicked through and filtered and blah, blah, blah. You don't, when you make your change, you don't want to have to reload the entire application, right? You don't <laughs> so. lose the current state. I, I think nice. of... I think of somebody who's going through a wizard and they're testing some sort of a, a, a wizard that that builds a builds a proposal or or mm -hmm. formats a document or something. I don't know, and and you get about three quarters of the way through and you're debugging it. And wouldn't it be a pain in the neck if you have, have to rerun those through that entire state every time you're debugging? That is so cool. To, it remembers. That is neat. Okay, so so. I guess what we've learned here, because um, we have our next kind of tougher exercises to build a to-do app, right? Yeah, yeah. But so let's make sure that that we've learned everything we need to learn here. We've got the kind of basics of what that razor syntax looks like. Yep. Um, we we've got our code is in that code block down at the bottom. Yep. And then right, we that's create just... properties and bind to them. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So right, we've well, it's not a property; it's a field if we think oh, about right, it that right. way i'll confess but, i still mix those up like i always <laughs> say the wrong one <laughs> um yeah. and when we when we look at and we think about these things it really in this code section it, it's almost like it's almost like a class without mm -hmm. a, a standard c-sharp class without us having to say right public class counter it is because it's inside this razor file yeah yeah Okay, question, what if, for whatever reason, just because I'm uptight or whatever, what if I don't like having that code in the Razor file? Can I refactor that? Can I move it into another class or something? Absolutely. You, you can certainly do that. We have that type of um, page model experience available, just like you had inside of Razor pages. You can pick all of this up and you can put it into a class file, just label it a partial class. Should we, do we want to go slightly off script here and do, show that real quick? I can do that. I guess, yes. <laughs> All right, so we'll go slightly off script here. I'm going to create another file here. I'm going to call it counter.razor.cs. So by convention, we name these the same as the rest of that Razor file with a .cs on the end of it. That's so, interesting, by the way. On the right side, now it's like, I don't know what you're doing. So, okay, yep. I had to so reconnect. It, it, it had to rebuild and then reconnect. So um, I'm going to declare the namespace here, right? This is namespace... Uh, Come on now, come on now. First app dot pages. All right, so file based namespace, and uh, this is a public partial class, um, and it was counter. Okay, and I can just pick up the rest of this right here. Just cut it right out, drop it in there, um, save, and yep, you yeah. need to reload. There oh. it is. And it's still subtracting. It's going in the negative direction. Let's nice. have it go in the positive direction. And come on, save. I'm waiting for my little restart here. Um, you know what? Yeah. I, I did a... Uh, it's called a rude edit, right? A so rude edit, yes. You, I, you I was, change enough of the application, it's like, hold on, I need to update this page. I need to think about that again. Yeah. So, And now it's counting up. Right. So we picked up all of our code because some folks, some folks see C sharp mixed with HTML and they get a little, eh, they get a little concerned. Mm -hmm. um, well, but you or, you know, maybe, maybe to start with, it's fine. But like if I've got a 2000 line razor file, maybe I want to start refactoring that, moving it around a bit more. Absolutely. And when you have things sitting in a class file like this, that means that you can you can create the class and run X unit tests against it or N unit tests. Mm -hmm. Whatever your favorite unit test framework is, you can run against this. Yeah. So. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, there's a question about 
updating, if I've got an existing like server app, could I convert that over to a WebAssembly app later? Um, you can. Um, it, it would probably be easier to create the WebAssembly app and just copy your, the contents of your pages folder. All of your .razor files, just copy them into the other application and it should run exactly the same way. Yeah, and what I've, you know, like, I naively told people like, yeah, it's just five lines of code, you switch. And that's kind of true. I mean, there's there's not a whole bunch of lines that update, right? There are some, yeah. there's packages and bootstrapping code. But the bigger problem is, if you've developed a Blazor server application, you may be talking directly to your database, or you may be, you know, relying on server side resources. And now you need to kind of rethink your application a bit more. So when you Absolutely. move to WebAssembly, you've got to consider like, oh, my static files are here instead of here and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. so. But the, the static files behave the same way. They're yeah. living in that dub dub root. They behave the same way as they do inside of an ASP.NET Core application. Yep. yep. All right. Uh, question about um, from Rizwan. So we don't have to inherit from component base anymore? That's correct. You do not have to in inherit from component base. You can just create the partial class and it will it will mash together and you'll be able to work with it. You can inherit from component base if you want to take advantage of some of the um, some of the base features of the component that you may want to interact with. Or maybe you want to interact, uh, you want to inherit from a, another class that inherits from base component. You can do, uh, I'm sorry, component base. You can inherit from that middle class that maybe sets up some standard capabilities that you want to inject into components. You can do that okay. as well. Uh, one more question, and then I'm sure. itching to get this to do app bill. Um, yeah. Is uh, Eric Diane's asking? Is the scope per page or application? The scope. Which scope are we referring to? So I'm guessing that's for this code right here, and mm -hmm. it's just because of the namespace, right? You've got namespace first yeah, that's a, pages counter. Yeah, that namespace is per file. So, in, oh right, right. Yeah. The the C sharp uh, design team. They, they did a quick search of folks that were building applications, open source applications on GitHub. Hey, let's see how folks are using the language. And it turns out not very many folks are using more than one namespace in a file. So let's simplify and allow you to just declare the namespace for the file as a single line. And you don't have to tab and set up the whole block construct yeah. there. Yep. So. Which uh, I... I I'm struggling to remember ever doing <laughs> putting more than one namespace in a file. Maybe with generated code, but that's about it. Yeah, maybe only because we're generating many, many things in one file. And okay, sure, makes sense. Cool. So, all right. Oh, I am wondering here. Did we? Are we up to a knowledge check yet? I think we are. That's exciting. A knowledge checks are fun. Yeah. All right. All right. Let me open this back up to full size. Come here, you. Uh, that's not full size screen. It's funny because we were worrying we were going to run out of stuff, and we added on tons of extra possible content we'd get to, and I don't even know if we'll, <laughs> we'll barely get there. Oh, we'll get that. there. Okay. We will get there. All right. So um, create and run a Blazor web app. We did that, and we ran the app. So knowledge check time. Here we go. All right. Blazor okay, web apps. So I'll, use I'll, which uh, runtime? Blazor web apps use which runtime? Okay. So let's think through these and and answer in the chat. Uh, interested to see what you folks come up with. Okay. So a the runtime provided by the browser. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Interesting. Uh, the .NET runtime deployed with your web app. Okay or C, the JavaScript runtime deployed with your web app? Well, I'm going to right away cross off C because we're not deploying a JavaScript runtime. For sure. Our app. Yep. Um, so, and actually we should probably, the title on this, this is Blazor Web Assembly Apps, right? Uh, Blazor Web Apps. Okay. So I'm going to, so I'm kind of, a little confused here. I would okay. think B because mm -hmm. the .NET runtime we're sending that along with our with our web app, right? So Blazor web app, uh, Blazor WebAssembly is sending 
the runtime along with it. It is. You're right. All right. So I'm going to go with B here. Okay. When, and I see a couple folks saying, yeah, definitely. I see Bandy Tool with the Kappa there. Definitely C. I see your sarcasm. Um, Rizwan asking, is it a server or WebAssembly app? Well, doesn't matter. Um, certainly Dev. Question. Some people are saying A. Yeah. So, so an interesting thing here is I, I really do feel like it's, it's a little confusing, and I would answer it different if it was Blazor WebAssembly or Blazor Server. Okay. Because what if I got rid of the word web and it was just Blazor apps? Yeah, I, I would go with B then. Okay. I mean, if, when we're talking runtime, we're, I'm thinking the runtime that's running my apps, I'm going to say B. Uh, Anthony, cool thinking outside of the box with D. Oh, man. Nice. The okay. Blazor web apps use the Fritz runtime. That's what letter <laughs> D is. All right, let's go with B. Final uh, answer. Let's go with B. Final answer. Um, can we can we get the who wants to be a millionaire sound effects? Um, the answer is, of course, oh, yes, okay. it's B. All right, we've got another question. All right, you had to find. Okay, I think I can answer this more quickly. Yeah, so, go for it. Okay, so Razor Pages mix of HTML and C sharp. That's sounding pretty good to me as a XAML page using XML. So. So no, not for Blazor. So if you did want to use XML or XAML style, then I would look at like Project Uno. Mm, um, sure. So or but also that's not Blazor. Um, that's Uno. Hmm. What's that? That's that's not Blazor. That's Uno though. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So definitely not. And then in C sharp to find in .NET standard libraries. That's just crazy. So so that's, I mean. I wonder, you know, if somebody's written, to, can you define, you could probably hack around and define a bunch of Blazor UI in the back end, right? Like in C Sharp, but that's not the standard way of doing it. No, that's not the standard way. You can certainly, gosh, just like we used to do back in the day, building our yeah. own web forms uh, controls, you can write your own stuff to render like yeah. that. All right, I'm going to go with A. You're going to go with A. I, th I like Surly Dev's answer on Twitch in VBA with Excel form control. There you go. There you go. <laughs> There's probably some vendor out there right now that's making a VBA to Blazor. All right, yeah. let's go with A. All right, let's do this. And of course, the answer is, of course, Woo! it's A. You saw the Razor pages and it was mixing HTML and C Sharp. All, so, right. all right. Okay. Do good stuff. So we're good keeping stuff. on. All right. So we configured our local environment. All we had to do is install the, the .NET SDK. Visual Studio Code comes with the C Sharp extension that's going to allow you to build and work with Blazor. We created a new Blazor project right there at the command line with a simple .NET new command, and we added some client-side logic. We changed around how you were able to click and interact with that counter component. Okay. All right. All right, so um, we've got. A de we're gonna have to kind of speed up to get through this. I was this gonna say, it looks bit. like we dropped out the to do app, did we? Oh my goodness! Well, did that's what we want to do next is the to do, right? Yeah, let's do the to do app next. I think I just added those slides in the wrong order. Oh, all right. Wow, Watch I added a thousand slides here. Slide. Should, I, should I go back to the slide list and jump around? Let's go back to let's go over to the to, to the module itself. To the module you know what I mean? Like absolutely, I can do that because I don't see them in there. Sure, I'm going to go grab the module, um, <laughs> and I'm going to go right there. Jump right into the learn module. Hey, who turned oh, off my dark mode before? Actually, so that was if you looked in the slides, it would be slide like. Yeah, we jumped ahead a bit here. We jumped way ahead. Um, Component, like I think we're looking at side like 26, 27. Do those cover it? You know what? These were commented out. They were. All right. Let's out. let's just go with the, we want to build the to-do app. Part, let's right? do the to-do app. All right. So here's the exercise. Uh, well, the next exercise was actually to add the counter component to the page. We're going to skip forward and we're going to yeah. do build a to-do app. Yeah right on the page. Um, you can follow along on, uh, this is unit seven of the Blazor module. 
Um, I'm going to pivot away from the screen so I can actually write the code here. Um, okay. Never fear, I have it up and running on another screen so I can see what's going on and we can stay on task here because John and I are doing nothing but staying on task. That's, that's it. <laughs> Laser focused today. Laser yep. focused here. All right. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to open another tab here in my Windows terminal. Um, and I'm going to jump into my Learn Live first app. And I'm going to create a new to-do page, and a, a Razor component um, in the Pages folder for, for a, a to-dos page. So let's create that real quick here. .NET new. Razor components. So .NET new isn't just project templates, but it's also file templates. And I'm going to name this uh, to do, and I'm going to output it in the pages folder. You see the pages folder right there. I'm going to put this new component right there next to the rest of it. Let me okay, jump back so, over. So you're adding a component to the the project we already built. You're just continuing to build on top of this and adding new stuff yep. to it. And there it is, to-do.razor. And I get my very simple to-do page here that I can start building with. Now, okay, question. If I yeah. wanted, if I, I could have also just created a file called to-do.razor. Sure. And written that. I, it's just HTML and a code block at the bottom, yeah. right? Like, my question is, it's not doing any special magic wire up in the project yeah. file or something else. No, it, it, Blazor is simple enough that the content to build this as a page is just these three lines of code. So, okay. yeah, you're right, John. You you could just start a new text file and name it whatever dot razor appropriate for you and your what content you're going to build and just fill it with the razor content that you need. Okay. All right. So. I want to make this accessible on, on my navigation panel, right? Let me go back over to, to the actual page. I want to put another entry over here on the left for the okay. to-do. So I'm going to go back over and to... Well, you do that. John Bronsma in the chat is pointing out we missed the opportunity to say we're blazer-focused today. And for that, we do apologize. That's not bad. I got to remember that for next time. <laughs> That's pretty good. All right, I'm going to copy and paste the fetch data. That's the final sample here. I'll let you out there, uh, friends, click through and see how the fetch data sample works on, on your own time. But here we go. I'm going to click through nav link, and I'm going to have this navigate to a page called to do. Okay. Um, and it's a list rich. And instead of saying fetch data over here, I'm going to give it a label of to do. Now, this is on my other tab here, still running and hot reloading, John. Nice. To do is already there. Okay. Yeah, there's now, nothing at that address. Nothing at that address. And one thing that I saw in the tutorial, we don't have a page directive at the top of that component, right? You're right. Let's go back to that. Ta da. So we say page to do. Go back over here. And there okay. it is. Okay. So that page directive, what I'm seeing there is it's important for a few reasons. Like one, it turns it into a page and two, it exposes the routing. So it says, this is how I get to it. Exactly. Okay. This is when you want to go to this location, this is the content to return. Very cool stuff. Great. All right. Okay. Let's create a and model for us to work with here. We want to track to do. So I'm guessing we're going to need some sort of model class. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to, where does it want us to put this? In the root of the project, no problem. Sure, will, why not? I will do that. I'm just going to click into somewhere over here so I can go and create uh, to do item.cs. Cool. And uh, I'm going to put this in a namespace. And it is first app. And let's create a class for this to do item. And I'm going to create two properties. Ah, oh, come on. Thank you. Um, string and I'll define a title and I'll create another property here and I'll make this a boolean called is done. Cool. All right. So simple. Uh, just one, one thing I'm trying not to interrupt too much, no, but please. That, it's interesting that title you'll see with .NET 6 now you're going to get the squiggle and your code is fine. But it's just telling you like, hey, this is, you know, like this is a nullable field and this could cause problems. 
and they're really with the .NET 6 templates really pushing you to do proper null checking and like Absolutely. mark things as nullable and stuff. Yep. So I can put a question mark here to say, well, this yep. can be null. <laughs> yep. You're allowed to make that null. I'm going to put a couple of spaces in here just to give my property some breathing room. Okay. So on my to-do page, I'd like to output a list of to-dos, right? Okay. I want to format and write some content there. So let's create a collection of to-dos to work with here. So I'm going to define a field here. It's going to be a list full of to-do items, and I'll call it to-dos. Okay. And I'm just going to use a, um, a new statement here to define that new list. And, uh, well, a, a list of items is, of course, an unordered list in HTML. So let's use that here. And I'll just write a simple for each statement. Uh, for each to do in to do's. That doesn't sound weird at all. Um, and we'll just output. I just have to say, Blazer Mr. Magoo is on the chat, which is amazing. Um, hey great there. Community contributor and all kinds of. And, uh, and they're recommending that we should include a. Uh, defer until tomorrow property. Fantastic. That's a great idea. Something to think about. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to make it a lazy initialized property. Of right. Course. There you go. <laughs> all right. Good. That's um, all right. So I've just got a simple list of the to do's that we're going to output. And of course, oh no, I've got an exception over here. Oh. Let's refresh. And I bet, yeah, look at this. Oh no. What happened? Let's uh, force a reload here, force a rebuild, and see if we can figure out what, what Fritz did wrong here. Starting, there it is. And there's our to-do. Now there's there's nothing in the list. There's nothing to do. So there's nothing. Take the rest of the day off, Jeff. Fantastic. It's vacation time. <laughs> yeah. I'm done. No, no. We want to put a put an input placeholder in here so we can start creating some to-dos. Okay. So let's do that. Let's put a put a little input box t down here and we'll put a placeholder and we'll say uh something to do right uh put a like that and uh let's add a button here mm -hmm. right um add to do right and if we go back now we're talking now oh. we're starting to get a to-do sample okay so now we want to wire up, just like we saw in the in the counter, we want to wire up the click handler for that add to do button so it actually does something. Right, because so, if you hit that button now, it's not wired, it's not doing anything. It doesn't yeah. do anything, right? Uh, right. My, write my, uh, 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 I don't know, write my shopping list. Right, and nothing. Doesn't do anything. Nothing. Okay. This is the easiest to do application ever. <laughs> It doesn't Certainly. make you actually do anything. No, you don't. What's there to do? <laughs> it's dev null. Okay. That's right. All right. So we actually want to wire that up. So let's go down here. Let's write the method that we want this to call first, because I think that is a little bit more self-explanatory. So um, we want to capture that string inside the input. So we're going to provide somewhere to capture that. And we're going to call it new to do. And okay. we're going to take that input. And just like we do in, in XAML, in Windows Forms, we're going to bind that content. So I'm going to at bind. And I want to bind this is, that. This is very similar to what we saw in the counter, right? Where we were yes. bound to the counter and it automatically. So this is two-way binding then, huh? Mm -hmm. nice. So I'm okay. going to define this with string.empty. So we have a value on there to start with. And right, this is going to start with empty content. So let's actually write the method that's going to capture that string and, and put it into our to-dos list here. So I'm going to write a little method here, private add, private void add to-do, right? And uh, well, let's check to make sure we have some content there. Um, if it's not null or white space, uh, the new to-do that is, mm -hmm. right? Um, let's take our list of to-dos and let's add a new item, a new, I'm, I'm noticing that my, um, 
GitHub code spaces and isn't installed in this Visual uh, Studio code. Yeah. So it's not jumping in and suggesting, hey, Fritz, let me let me solve all that for you. <laughs> I'm always surprised. It's scary smart. Like half the time it's like, oh, yeah, that's that's actually what I was going to type. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there we go. I'm going to add that to the to do's list uh, and yeah. clear out my new to do. OK, now I actually need to trigger this when we click the button. So we know how to do on click of a button. It's just on click equals um, add to do. But in Blazor, that's a little bit different, right? When we do button on click like that, that's a JavaScript on click. And this is Razor. So, John, when I think Razor, I think I put the at sign in front of things that are C sharp that I want to be C sharp things. And it's the same thing with this event handler. You put the at in front of it and it becomes a C sharp event handler saying, go call this C sharp method inside. Uh, of so it's like your JavaScript on click, but that at thing makes it a, a, a razor C sharp or a blazer C sharp on click. Yep. Yep. You got it. So I'll save that. And hot reload has happened. You didn't even see it, but it happened. Yeah. Super so, hot. Uh, I need to make my shopping list, right? And now I'm getting items in my to-dos. Um, order the Thanksgiving turkey. Um, prepare the pumpkin pie. And it's just nice. adding those to that list. So we have cruised through this. The one thing I, I noticed that we didn't, that we didn't include is marking things done. Yeah, we should do something about that, huh? Yeah. All right. So, and it'd be nice if we could edit some of that content too. Oh yeah. So let's do that. So it, that's just a block of text there that it's painting on screen. Mm -hmm. We can light this up a little bit and make it a little bit more interesting. So let's do this. Let's put in a, uh, a checkbox here input type checkbox and this time i'm going to at bind to um well i've i've got the to do item here i'm going to bind to the is done field and, and that's all there is to it that's all there is to it to building the input for that let me let give you a uh a checkbox for not a checkbox i'm sorry a text box for the title there, and I forgot the at in front of that. So it knows that that's a C-sharp binding. Done. Okay. Head back over here, and now I'm gonna go and reload things, reload this up, right? So uh, uh, make my shopping list, um, order the turkey. Oh shoot, I misspelled that, hang on, that's better. Um, and I'm able to now have this extra level of interaction. Mm -hmm. And Last you can, thing, yeah, you can mark them done. I can, I can mark them done, but it doesn't really do anything to reflect it there. So let's add next to that to do up top here. Just another little bit of binding. I'm going to take that to do's and run a little bit of link against this. And I'm going to say for it, for each to do, Give me a count where the to do's are not is done. And right now it's zero and it updates. I have two to do, one to do, zero to do. Wow. Done. Like that, that seems right. There, there's some magic in the refresh that's happening here that just feels a little bit too, <laughs> too good to be true in the web browser. Yeah. Yeah. And what's really nice here is that, like, this is magic kind of as a developer experience. And you were able to write that C-sharp code. Damien's asking, can we add some styling? And what's really nice is this is web standard. So this ships with Bootstrap 5.1. So anything in Bootstrap 5.1, you can drop in. Or if you if you had another library or something else you prefer, I mean, there's, you know, tons of others exposed through, like, Mudblazer, Blazor Eyes, et cetera. Absolutely. Can, or, right, you can just do things like uh, color line. Yep. So, right. and like right. you talked about earlier, there's also support for, uh, you You have CSS isolation. 
So mm -hmm. right, you could do uh, to do dot razor dot css, and you could put your styles in there too. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Um, so. Cascadia Mono. So beautiful. Um, right. It needs to look like a coder wrote this. <laughs> uh, cool. All right. So yeah. we've got our nice to do zap and, and it looks nice. Um, I thought I saw another comment or two in here. Yeah. So we added some styling and you can do even more with that, of course. Well, you know, so, I mean, since we have gotten through the majority of the code here, there's a question of how would you hook this to a database? Um, and so this is interesting. This is a this is a Blazor server application. So because yeah. of that, you have access directly, like you can run any framework code right in here, right? Sure. So, uh, oh, let's let's get a little crazy, <laughs> um, right? So I'm gonna open up the terminal right here. Let's add, right, uh, .NET add, uh, gosh, if only I was doing a session on Entity Framework today that I could remember exactly the commands that I was going to reference <laughs> here. Uh, .NET add package, Microsoft, entity, framework, core, add that one. Mm, I need another one here. And uh, as you're doing up. this, so for folks watching, we've gotten to the end of the kind of like main module content we're going to be covering. So, you know, uh, we'll be answering questions. Um, we've got a few kind of resource slides at the very end, but, you know, mostly now Q&A and whatever random other stuff we just hook up on the fly now so yeah um let me see here all right done so okay, i have so those you tools just added ef core which for people that are new to net ef is a an orm um so it's a it's a it's an abstraction that makes it easy to connect to a database yep absolutely so um i need to create a a context a database context so i knew know exactly how i want to interact with that so let's put it up here in the data um, and let's just call this uh, my DB, my DB context CS. I'll define a namespace. Thank you. Um, oh, right. This was first app. So first app data um, public class. Right. My DB context. No, I want a DB. So there's some the magic there. You're inheriting from DB context. That's right. And DB context is part of EF core that adds all the kind of database connections and makes it easy to, you can work with objects. You can update things in, in your object and it'll persist it back to a database. Yep. All right. So there I've got that. Let me head back over to... Uh, oh, you know what? Let me do. Let me just do model on creating here, so I can force the location of of a SQLite database just to make it. Um, nah, right? What am I thinking? Um, right, there's a little bit of magic that is about to happen here. Do, 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 do. Well, you're doing that. Good question from Rizwan asking: Can Blazor be used with gRPC? Absolutely, yes. Oh yeah. Um, let's see, add, right, add db context. There it is. And it's going to be data dot, no, data dot, uh, oh, right. It, it was my db context. There it is. Right. Now I also want to put some configuration on that. So let's do something like this, right? And it's going to be options. Let's do, uh, use SQLite because I put that down. Um, I'm trying to remember my database file name, uh, the connection string. If only I had written that in another module, in another stream about <laughs> eight hours ago, and I could remember exactly where to look for it. So for anyone other... that doesn't know, Jeff streams all the time on .NET <laughs> stuff, and he was doing an EF core class this morning. So he was teaching all kinds of stuff. Also, if you're new to EF, we have an EF uh, community stand up every other Wednesday. So yeah, our friend, live TV. Our, our friend Jeremy Lickness hosts that and yeah. does a fantastic job teaching folks um, all about the cool stuff that's available to you. There we go. Get my using statement loaded in. And I think that's all we now, need. Do you need to hook up? Do you need to do migrations in order to do this? Gosh, we do need to do some migrations. Let's build out a database here. Um, I might need to update my EF tool. 
I'm almost positive I need to update my EF tool. Uh, this is brave. I, I tried live coding up something this past Friday with an MVC app and all of a sudden remembered like, oh yeah, I need to do migrations and oh, I need to do this oh, yeah. and it took more time than I was. Uh, stand by, give me one second here. I have the command sitting right here in another, on another screen. There it is. We're just going to update the tools that I have installed here. So I make sure I have the .NET 6 version. There you go. Updated from .NET 5 to .NET 6. Let's create a migration here. .NET EF migrations add uh, first to do. A good right. question from DJ Maddock. Can you use Dapper instead of EF? Or absolutely. Certainly. So you can, it's .NET code. You can use any database access you want. Um, if you want to use uh, EF, you can. It's uh, That's something that we build and document so it's easier for us to show it off, but yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Um, oh, it's running. <laughs> Uh, it's running over here. You can't run .NET watch and run your EF tool at the same time. Otherwise, you oh. get a little bit of a collision there. Yeah, that's what I thought. All right. So we, we are, we we're are coming up on time. Our, so when, we, when you finish this, we're going to want to jump in on slide 56. Um, Fantastic. We've got, we've got a few. Uh, do, 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 do. No database provider. Sure, it's defined right there. Um, if add db context use also in short contains ah uh, i need the constructor i knew i'd try to be too yeah. fancy with this all right there's the constructor and it needs to accept one of these called my db context uh and we'll call this options base options there we go so just a little bit of magic code that passes along the configuration of the entity framework um, context. And um, Robert is saying you can use context database and sure created async. Uh, yes, no, not for... but we're not. Yeah, we're not quite there yet. I need an ID on these things. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, so I'm just going to create one. So even though I'm not really using it, so. IDs are necessary for a database to, to persist things, right? So. Yep. There we All go. All right. That's exciting. Cool. So let's create that database, .NET EF database update. And we'll end up with a little app DB file sitting right about here. So we're doing this part really quick. We have whole courses on how to do this and, uh, and docs, but there it is. Magical. App okay. DB. So there you go. You've got SQLite. And EF Core works with a lot of different databases. So, of course, SQL Absolutely. Server and Oracle and MySQL and all kinds of others. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. SQLite's so, nice. And if you didn't see it, at .NET Conf, Steve Sanderson did a demo where he used EF Core with SQLite in the browser WebAssembly. So it actually was running SQLite in the browser. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, that's a little bit out there. Not something that I would entirely recommend folks to get involved with. <laughs> but it's neat that you could. <laughs> you could do it. I don't know if I'd go quite there. Uh, all right. So when this gets created, um, let's do this. Let's, am I going to get the override here? Oh, I, I just might. Look at that. Um, so let's say, uh, to do's equals. Uh, we got, we've to got just uh, like a minute and a half left, so we do need Easy to kick. kind of point people out the. Absolutely, one second here. So we did to do's add, and I'm also going to say context to do's add um, that same new to do item. I'm gonna put the same one in there. Uh, Right. And uh, context dot safe changes done. That's it. Run it. I'm not dot, dot net watching. Just run it and show me this thing in the browser. Right. There we go. Back over to here. Refresh. So Magical. if I add these uh, uh, order a uh, turkey. And it's actually saving that in between, and it's still there. OK, we got to flip Fantastic. over to the last slides in our last minute or so just to make sure people see. So Absolutely. if you go to slide 56, and we'll go 56, 57, and 58. Fantastic. 
So, so this is the module we ran through, and you can run through this, the AKS Blazor ASP.NET Core. So that will walk you through in detail. Uh, go to the next. Yep. A couple resources. Yep. So tons of resources on all kinds of things. So there's this module, and there's also .NET and our YouTube. And the last one, this. So this is we're part of a series here. So we did this one today, and um, and we've got you know more more coming up. Gosh, I'm not sure. Fifty nine. So slide fifty nine. Actually, I set up some additional links, and it looks like it's hidden now. So I don't know. Uh, let's see if I can bring that up real quick. Do, 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 do. Yeah, there it is. this one. It's, it is an ugly slide, but it has important information because it's got this this link here. That so Blazor Learn More, AKMS Blazor dash Learn More has a link to a bunch more stuff for learning about Blazor. Yep, there you go. And wonderful. Let's come share it out in the chat. All right, John. Whew, that was a sprint. That was a sprint. That was a lot of stuff. So I think we we covered from beginning with what the heck is Blazor up through building an app and and then just just for extra saving it to a database because why not? Well, it, we got a question about well, how do I save stuff to the database? And when you're running Blazor server side like that, you can you can reach out and touch the database that that's in your data center or like the SQL uh, database just sitting on disk there right with you. Absolutely. Yeah. And then with Blazor WebAssembly, you'd have a little more work. You'd have to use an API to get back to it. Yeah. So awesome right. stuff. Well, as you mentioned earlier, Jeff, we're for our uh, ASP.NET community stand up tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Pacific, we're going to be having just a .NET recap for web developers. So yeah. we can talk about Blazor stuff and, and uh, just all the new minimal APIs and just kind of a, a, a general chat for web devs. What's new? We've both done a few sessions and and um, presentations on this so we'll just kind of share our favorite stuff oh it'll be a lot of fun i can't wait to hang out with you and and talk with you folks out there about all the cool things that you can do as a web developer now with net six awesome all right uh well i guess that's it for it's uh, time for us to to wave goodbye i think there's some peppy music that plays when we finish yeah so great seeing everybody uh let's get to that peppy music <laughs> 